So we're beginning the membrane structure and cell membrane uh, transport, and this is part two of that. Here we're really going to get into the transport, so how particles are moved across the membrane. We've spent some time previously talking about the membrane itself, the structure of the cell membrane. We've then looked at the forces that act on particles to be able to move across the membrane. So the electrical force, the chemical force. And then now we're really gonna put that together and think about uh, how and why and at what rate things actually move across the membrane. So we're gonna hit the first two objectives together. One is to identify the three general factors that influence the rate at which a substance can passively uh, be transported across the membrane. And then we're gonna talk about two factors that influence the rate of active transport as well. And objective two is to think about factors that affect the permeability of a membrane to molecules. So what allows some things to go through and other things to not, which is the permeability. Let's begin by thinking about the rate of transport and looking at how particles move across a membrane. So when we think about a uh, solution, which we can see at the top panel here, it's separated by this semi-permeable membrane and it's got particles dissolved in both sides. So there's particles dissolved in the solution on both sides. Now, what we can see is that there's movement happening in both directions. This is what we refer to as being one-way flux. So there's no net flux. So we can consider that this scenario is at the fusional equilibrium. There's no net transfer of molecules from one side. So when we say that transport is happening, we typically mean net transport, meaning that there's accumulation of said particles on one side or the other. So particles will move to become at the fusional equilibrium. And one of the factors that we've talked about before is the concentration gradient. So if we had higher concentration on one side, which is what we can see in the second scenario, now we have a gradient. Now we have higher concentration. Uh, we've got two moles dissolved on the left side and one mole on the right side. So now we have uh, a passive gradient and now we have net flux. Now we have movement accumulating from side one to side two. So when we think about particles moving, they're usually moving to become or to establish diffusion or equilibrium where there's an even concentration on both sides and there's no longer a net movement or net accumulation of particles. There can still be one way flux, but no net accumulation. On that basis, we can think about passive transport, which we described earlier as being spontaneous, as um, liberating energy, so not requiring energy, and being a downhill type of movement or down the gradient type of movement. Uh, the types of passive transport or examples that we have are simple diffusion, which requires no extra stuff, right? Doesn't require any transporters, proteins, carriers, none of that stuff. It's simply particles moving through the membrane for which they are permeable. Uh, another type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. And as the word facilitated would imply, this type of diffusion needs help. It needs some type of carrier um, in order to guide these particles through this structure in the membrane. And these carriers are usually going to be proteins. And then the third example of passive transport is diffusion through channels. And channels are, can be pores in the membrane and they differ from uh, carriers in that they're not actively engaged in the process. They're basically just passageways for particles to move through the membrane. So these are the three types of uh, examples of passive transport that we'll look at a little bit closer. Now let's continue to describe simple diffusion. Some of the characteristics is that there's no membrane proteins needed. Um, transport is straight through the lipid bilayer. So these are particles that must be able to go through the phospholipid bilayer. In other words, they must be nonpolar. Um, and so we think about this as easy movement uh, down the concentration gradient that is not requiring any proteins. Uh, factors that affect the rate of simple diffusion, in other words, how fast simple diffusion occurs, would be the magnitude of the driving force, 
Um, and this can be, uh, again, if we're thinking about our uh, particles moving, if we have a greater concentration gradient, we have a greater chemical driving force, so we're gonna have a faster rate of simple diffusion. Another factor is the membrane surface area. So if we have more membrane available for movement, if we have a larger surface area, and we'll talk about some examples of that, we're gonna see more movement of particles and we're gonna see a faster rate of simple diffusion. And then third is the membrane permeability. Now, if the membrane is not permeable to a particle, it doesn't matter what size the concentration gradient is, you will have zero movement, okay? Even if you have a large concentration gradient, a large amount on one side and zero on the other side, and the membrane in question is not permeable to the particle in question, then even with a large gradient, you have zero movement. So the permeability, the ability of the particle to get through that membrane is another factor that affects the weight. Now let us illustrate uh, what that looks like, the weight of simple diffusion and how that can change. So simple diffusion is affected by Here are the things that will impact the weight of simple diffusion. First is the magnitude of the driving force. Okay, and the example we're gonna give here is the chemical driving force, which we know is the concentration gradient. Okay, so it's the magnitude of the driving force. Um, another thing that will determine the rate is the permeability of the membrane. So let's put a little one here. So, sorry, one, let's put a two here. The permeability of the membrane Okay, to the particle in question. And the third factor we said is the surface area available for transport. So the surface area available for transport. Okay, so our three factors that will affect the rate of simple diffusion. Now let's look at our three scenarios here. So we've got scenario A, scenario B, scenario C. Okay. And we're gonna think about our containers, our hypothetical containers here being separated by a semi-permeable membrane that is permeable to the particle in question. So this is a semi-permeable membrane. Now let's think about the concentration uh, that is dissolved in the solution on either side. So in the scenario A, let's say we have one mole of particles dissolved in this solution. And then we have pure water, so zero particles on the other side. In scenario B, let's say we have slightly less, so we have 0.8. moles of particles on the left side versus 0.5 moles. moles on the right side. And then finally, in scenario C, we have 0.5 on both sides. So we have an even amount of particles dispersed on both sides. 
Okay. We should already begin to predict the type of movement that we would see across these three scenarios. So in scenario A, we have a really strong concentration gradient. So we have a really fast rate of transport. I'm going to draw a big arrow here, really to highlight the great um, or that, that magnitude of the driving force, which is owed to the magnitude of the concentration gradient, which means that we have a faster rate of transport from side one to side two. So here we have a strong chemical driving force. And therefore, we have a faster rate of transport. Right, transport or simple diffusion. Faster rate of transport or faster rate of simple diffusion. Inside B, we have a gradient, but it's smaller. It's smaller in terms of the magnitude. So we have somewhat of a medium, slightly smaller arrow, concentration gradient, and therefore a medium rate of simple diffusion. So a medium constant our, our chemical driving force equals medium rate of transport and then in scenario C we basically have one way flux so we talked about this we do not have net accumulation because we don't really have a gradient so that is not to say that there will not be movement of particles but there will be no net accumulation of particles on one side or the other because we have no chemical driving force Therefore, we have no concentration. So no CDF equals zero rate of transport. Okay. And then here we can describe our particles as being at diffusional equilibrium. So diffusional equilibrium is where we have um, zero movement, just one-way flux because we have zero concentration gradient. And as we would imagine, the rate of simple diffusion here is zero. So this is just to illustrate that if we have a greater magnitude, we have a uh, strong permeability, then we're going to increase the rate of simple diffusion. And in order to really highlight the third point, so the surface area available, we can think about adding these two scenarios together. Let's say I were to place this scenario on top of this membrane. Sorry, my cursor got stuck. And I extended the amount of surface area. Right? Let's say I continue to expand the membrane such that there was more surface area for movement. That would double the rate of transport. So the rate that I see here is only representation of the amount of surface area that's available, the amount of membrane. If I increased for some reason, I'm just going to draw a dotted line here, and I doubled my membrane, then I would actually double the rate of transport as well. So that really highlights this third factor, that as we increase the surface area available for transport, we likewise increase the rate of transport or simple diffusion as well. All right, please let me know if you have any questions on this. Any questions? So let's keep going here. Let's talk about how 
let's talk about those individual factors in somewhat of a different way. So just re really reiterating what we just described. So simple diffusion is affected by the magnitude of the driving force. And another way to express that is looking at this graph here. So here's our concentration gradient, and then here's our net flux on the Y. And if we look at the linear relationship of these two variables, we'll see that as the concentration gradient increases, the net flux, in other words, the rate of movement of particles, accumulation of particles, is going to increase in a directly proportional relationship, okay? And this is gonna go on indefinitely. So as the concentration gradient can get bigger, so too can the rate of simple diffusion get bigger. The second factor we describe is the membrane surface area. And a great example of this in the body is the alveoli of the lungs. So here is what the normal alveolar air spaces should look like. So we can see these nice little small air pockets. And because they're so small, and they have this much membrane exposed, there's a lot of surface area available for a gas exchange. Remember, gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs across the alveoli of the lungs. So having these grape-like clusters, really small structures, um, and having this much membrane exposed means that we're gonna have more adequate rates of oxygen transport across our membrane. Uh, alternatively, if you look at the panel on the right, this is what uh, emphysema and other uh, interstitial lung disorders will look like. Um, not interstitial, excuse me, um, alveolar disorders will look like. So this is basically collapsing of the alveoli, okay? Collapsing of the alveoli. Um, this can be a chronic uh, effect of smoking, for example. And what we see is that we lose some of that membrane surface area. So the alveoli begin to collapse or kind of pop like bubbles and there's less surface area available for gas exchange. So what that means is the rate of oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide release decreases. So that makes breathing very difficult, right? And that can lead to some other complications. Um, and it really just impacts um, the lung function, but the overall circulatory system because there's now less oxygen um, being absorbed uh, or at a slower rate. So this is an example, a really great example of how having adequate membrane surface area uh, increases uh, the, the rate of simple diffusion. And this can be of particles, of gases, of, um, of molecules, et cetera. Let's look at some of the factors that affect uh, the rate. So these are the ones that we've described. Uh, we talked about the surface area and we talked about um, the let's see the magnitude of the driving force. So the magnitude of the driving force, the surface area. The third factor is the membrane permeability. And the membrane permeability becomes a little bit more um, tricky or complex because there are other factors. So we can further classify factors that affect the membrane permeability itself. Um, so this would be the solubility of diffusing substances, the lipid solubility. Are these substances polar? Are they nonpolar? Do they exist in nonpolar environments? In other words, can they actually get through the phospholipid bilayer? And we know that um, polar molecules cannot do that. So a polar molecule is not going to uh, be able to um, be permeable and it's not going to affect the rate of simple diffusion. The size and shape of the diffusing particles, so large bulky particles, uh, charged particles like ion, sodium, and calcium also cannot get through the membrane. They're gonna need uh, carriers or um, channels in order to facilitate their movement through the membrane. So the size and shape will also affect the permeability. Lastly is the temperature. And the temperature is not always relevant in our human physiology just because our body temperature uh, through homeostasis strives to maintain um, that um, set point value. So our temperature is not very much variable, um, but in um, scientific experiments or in exogenous environments, um, it can be relevant to think about the temperature because particles are vibrating 
higher or vibrating more rather at higher temperatures. And so that will just increase the movement of particles in general and therefore increase the permeability of the membrane to particles. Um, so again, it can be relevant in scientific experiments, but not so much relevant in our physiology. Lastly is the thickness of the membrane. So if the membrane is thicker, this one is really just sort of intuitive, right? It's gonna be harder for particles to just get through. It's gonna be more bulk in the way, more stuff for the particles to get through. And so a thicker membrane is also going to impact the weight, or not weight, excuse me, the permeability of the factors. Um, and then the permeability will in turn affect the weight. So I'm trying to be extremely uh, careful about how we classify these factors because the size, charge, solubility, thickness of the membrane are factors that influence the permeability and the permeability will in turn influence the weight. So we can look at two different curves here again. So looking at our net flux of particles compared to the concentration gradient, if there's low permeability, this is what our curve is going to look like. So particles will get through, but at a slower rate. If there's high permeability, so we have nonpolar particles, uncharged particles like oxygen, um, we have a uh, stable temperature, we have a thin membrane. This is why our alveoli, our endothelial blood vessels, uh, our gastrointestinal lumen, anywhere that needs to have exchange or transport um, of particles needs to have a very thin surface uh, membrane in order for particles to get through uh, quite easily and to keep the high weight of transport. Okay. I'm gonna skip over these checkpoint questions. I'm actually gonna come back to these. I encourage you to uh, review the questions and write down your responses as our homework.